This is an interesting one. Life does not see CO2 as a poison. We do. Life sees it as what? Not energy, but a building block. A plant is made out of what? Where does the plant get the carbon? CO2. Every plant and blue-green algae in the world sees CO2 as a building block. It takes the CO2 and it turns it into starches and sugars, into polymers. Everything hard in the ocean, coral reefs, seashells, 50% of the coral reef's reef, that hard ceramic, comes from CO2. We are doing everything we can to take CO2 and push it under the ground as quickly as we can, right? We're like worried about CO2 for good reason. What if we started to use CO2 as a, as a building block? Solera, scientist who studied biomineralization, how your bones form and how coral reefs form and how seashells form, has, has gotten money to create a company and his process is he takes CO2 out of, out of smokestacks, bubbles it through seawater to make powdered limestone for concrete, for cement. Instead of cement these days, and this is, this is what he read, when you read something like this and something in your heart goes, that's not right. This is what Brent Constance read. He read a statistic that said for every ton of cement, Portland cement, it's part of concrete, that's created, a ton of CO2 is emitted. And he went, that's crazy. I work with coral reefs and they sequester CO2. Why can't we do that? So that's what he's doing. Kind of cool. Uh, here's a guy, um, Jeff Coates at Cornell. He said plants take CO2 and make, some, make them into long, star, long chain polymers. Why don't I take CO2 and make it into biodegradable plastics? The way plants do it, you see CO2 is not very reactive. So he had to find a catalyst. Based on what plants do, he found a catalyst to get CO2 to play together to make biodegradable plastics. This guy can make sunglasses out of CO2 and, and lemon juice, limonene. <laughs> I mean, if you have, a, have one of those like, why can't, if you're like walking along and you look at a plant and go, well that plant's using CO2, this, this trunk is made of air, take the next step. This is what all these guys have done. Now here's another thing. This is an interesting thing. We're moving towards bioplastics, okay? So we're moving from an era when we used hydrocarbons to carbohydrates. We used oil. Everything that you're sitting on right now is made of oil. That's made of oil and this is made of oil, right? All nylon stuff is made of oil. But we're moving to a point where we're going to start to use carbohydrates, right? Corn-based bioplastics, you know, the, the uh, forks and, and knives that you have in the cafeteria now, right? That, that compost, right? Now, where does that come from, though? Where does that carbon come from? It comes from the air, right? Right? But it comes through a corn plant first. So we're asking our corn plants to grab the CO2 for us and make it so that we can make forks and knives out of it. So what it really means is that agriculture is our new oil field. And the root, that's a root tip, is our new oil rig. And what we're mining this time is soil fertility. Instead of mining oil, we're mining soil fertility. We're growing crops to make plastics and biofuels. And that soil fertility is going down and down and down. This is a big design issue, you guys. We're robbing from soil that, ca that carbon. We need to get it back there. Or we need to be plants ourselves and take the CO2 and make them into plastics or biodegradable plastics ourselves, right? So we got to get better at agriculture. So there's a whole field, natural systems agriculture, it's called, and it's ecosystem inspired. Check out the Land Institute, West Jackson, studying prairies to come up with perennial polycultures instead of annual 
monocultures, which is what we have now, and that's why our agriculture is so so industrial and, and it needs so many inputs, right? Um, because it's very vulnerable. An annual plant has to be dug up every, the ground has to be dug up every year. A perennial plant stays there. It's what most prairies are, they're perennial. Or 99% oh, of the plants are perennial. Instead of having one species for miles that pests can just have an all-you-can-eat restaurant, prairies have a mixture. Confuses the pests. Epidemics don't get going. You don't need as many pesticides. So this guy, this guy, walked through a prairie one time and said, wait a minute, the prairie doesn't need our help. It's the most productive, one of the most productive systems on the planet. What, holds soil, sponsors its own fertility. I don't have to open up bags of fertilizer. Why aren't we using, why aren't we having a perennial polyculture for agriculture? Ask that question 30 years ago. He's been studying it ever since. This is, do you guys know what this, what's this a picture of? What? Yeah, it's silk, exactly. It's the business end of a spider. Isn't that beautiful? It's color enhanced. Those are spinnerets, six different kinds of silk, six different kinds of material properties. This happens to be dragline silk coming out right now from an orb weaver spider. That silk is five times stronger ounce for ounce than steel. If you took that silk and you put it into a strand the diameter of a pencil, it would hold a seven, it would stop a 747 in flight. So this is not, these are not, I mean these organisms, this is high tech. Okay, this blows us away. Now, what's interesting is, look at the way we make Kevlar, our toughest material. Take oil, bubble it in sulfuric acid, 1400 degrees Celsius, uh, Fahrenheit, draw it out under enormous pressures, it's called heat, beat, and treat. That's not how life does it, right? That's how we do it. But that caribou makes a ceramic it has to make it in or near its own body. The spider takes flies and crickets, mixes them up in water in its own belly, its own abdomen, right? And then very low pressure squeezes it out. So this is existence proof that an incredibly tough ceramic and an incredibly fine fiber can be made, not in heat, beat, and treat conditions, but in a beaker that you and I could be sitting here right now. You could have your kids playing around it. That's the new, that's the new model for agri for, um, uh, for manufacturing. So this is um, the mother of pearl nacre on the inside of an abalone shell, twice as tough as our high-tech ceramics. The ceramics that are in jet engines, this is twice as tough. And it crystallizes out of seawater. It self-assembles out of seawater. Okay, this is Jeff Brinker. There's a bunch of people working in this field in which they're learning how to have ceramics self-assemble out of water at room temperature. A lot of people. I could put a dot, dot, dot after that. If you think this stuff is cool, you've got to get, you got to get involved in this, right? This is really where the chemist, this is where the cool chemistry is, by the way. I mean, this is, this is where it's cool. These are um, diatoms, and they're, it's basically glass, it's silicas. And computer chips are made of silicon, of course. Um, that's, uh, those, see those little filaments? That's a sea sponge that Joanna Eisenberg from Harvard's holding. And those little filaments are as good as our fiber optics, only you can tie them in a knot. They're not brittle. And they self-assemble at seawater temperatures. So there's a whole field called biosilification, in which people are borrowing the recipe. And again, they're not using these organisms. Remember, this is not domesticating organisms to create nacre for you. This is what's very, very different. It's not a biotilization. It's not harvesting abalone. It's not bioassisted. It's not domesticating abalone. It's borrowing the recipe and doing it ourselves. Very, biomimicry is very, very different in that way.